guys doing today? Yeah, good. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank How you. Are you? We've, had, we've had a long journey in traffic, and uh, right. we've uh, had some. Wait, did you guys come down from LA? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the 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 five or the four hundred five will both treat you uh, badly, mm -hmm. no matter what road you're on. The people in Gaza don't understand the pain we had in LA traffic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, that went up on the way. Just I'll straight in there. <laughs> don't make your liability. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, we have. Yeah, this is all right. We're we're good. We're yeah, good. Um, so we're actually at WonderCon right now, and uh, I love being here. Uh, people here are so passionate about movies and TV. And have you have, have you for all of you have you been to Comic Con or WonderCon before? This is my first time at anything like this. First time in like WonderCon. I've done panels in my life, but I haven't done a panel with possibly a couple thousand Gandalfs sitting in the <laughs> audience. So. It's, uh, I'm actually super excited. I'm super excited about this. I was going to say, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of cool stuff downstairs, like stuff that you can buy and look around. Is there anything for you guys that you collect? Have you, or do you even know what WonderCon, like what is sold teeth. here? I collect teeth. <laughs> like your baby teeth or no, other people's, other people's, other people's, people's teeth? Other exclusively. Got it. Is there a place you can buy? Is it available on eBay? Just when they're asleep. <laughs> Just get in there in the dead of night. And do that. Um, he's a wizard. So right. he, 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 what he does is that he you know, just uses his magical skill yeah. to dig out, and when you wake up, it's a nice surprise, like, hey, I lost a couple yeah. of teeth. Yeah. He actually did my wisdom teeth, which was very considerate. Yeah. <laughs> you, it's just great banter, really. Isn't it? <laughs> this is how the TC base works, by the way, like right. the, you know, the friendship and the fellowship. I understand. So this is the way it was on set all the time. It's method. I've told them to be <laughs> like in their role in the character. Normally, these gentlemen are very serious yeah. and boring, quite boring in mm -hmm. all honesty. But they are in character. They're playing, you know, the, the characters of the TCPS. Uh, a lot of people. I'll, I'll, I'll be serious. So a lot of people have seen the trailer already, or the, the teaser trailer and trailer. Talk a little bit about um, uh, what for people that actually aren't that familiar. Talk a little bit about what the film is about. And as a filmmaker, what was it about this story that said, "I want to make this"? This. this I well, I'm a Tolkien fan myself. Read the books. I started Lord of the Rings when I was 12 or 13, and then Hobbit, and then Silmarillion, and then more adult age. Uh, but what struck me is his emotional own story. Like he was orphaned at a very young age, around 12, and uh, then he has to kind of, from that dark place, he has to build himself. You know, he finds friendship, he, a fellowship that guides him through his younger years, and he finds his amazing eternal love, Edith Pratt. And that story then, you know, when you think about this, reading it, it's so touching that it felt like it has to, it has to be a movie. <coughs> I haven't got a microphone. So <laughs> <laughs> you take that. What was the question? Uh, talk a little bit about what, for, for each of you, talk a little bit about the character you play, what the film is about, what drew you to the project, stuff okay. like that. Um, I play uh, Christopher Wiseman, who is a uh, valued member of the TCBS. And um, Christopher, Chris, I, for, for my money, when I first read it, I, f I felt Christopher had uh, a little bit of a troublemaker inside him. And he, he wanted to he wanted to test people. He, he liked pushing the boundaries a little bit. And uh, him and Tolkien particularly have quite a there's a fair bit of friction between them uh, for on a few occasions in the in the film. And uh, it was always with love. It was always with total respect, never with malice. And it was it was for me playing Christopher. It was always to try and bring out the best in Tolkien and make him realise that he was um, special. And that what he did and what he could produce in the future would be would be pretty spectacular if he had the right mindset. And um, and yet yeah, uh, Christopher had his had flaws as well, lots of them, as did all the boys really in their own ways. But um, but each each person in the TCBS played their own role and and played a very uh, important component in creating this sort of unit that they had that allowed them the freedom to uh, talk about these you know huge subjects that you know uh, and and investigate their uh curiosity don't know why that's funny yeah. it's just really good it's, it's a nice. really good answer it's just brilliant it's just right and I, i'd like to follow up on that it was what was really interesting about when, when tom was speaking there about well like uh, the camaraderie within the lads Dome really set a really good precedent for us and the first sort of day of shooting like it it never felt like we were going on set, I felt like we were going to a playground. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, we, it just felt like we were always having fun and always vibing <laughs> off one another. And Dome was like, 
you know, the the invisible member of the TCBS. <laughs> yeah. Dome was like with us, remember. sort of, you know, like 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 a, a sage old uncle, you know, just sort of guiding us into uh, into getting up to shenanigans. And he'd done this amazing thing when when we would have the take, Dome would go, okay, boom, we've got it. Now this one's for you. And that, I, I think that was just made us feel so free, you know, and relaxed on set. And it was just really about uh, making just this beautiful, fun film as opposed to, you know, a, a very serious biopic, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, um, yeah. For me, I, and I think that's that element is so important because I think it comes through in, in Tolkien's writing later on. Um, you sort of see how important that that brotherhood and that fellowship was to him. Um, and I, yeah, there's not really a way of replicating it other than just going for it. And mm. like like Anto said, that's what that's what uh, Dome definitely instilled in us on set. And um, yeah, it was it was the best one I've had. On, on and there's, yeah. there's to continue that, this joy of life that you recognize from the Hobbits. And in a way, the fellowship, the TCBS, you know, this gang, and including Nicholas Holt, as Tolkien, you know, they rep represent these kind of Hobbits that are inspired and love life. And that was something we wanted to also bring to the screen so that the audience could look at, you know, the film. And I want to be part of that, the joy, the fever of life and excitement and the inspiration, how they inspired each other. One of the things is, I think... Um, there's going to be obviously people that know his story and know what he went through, but for the average person, his story is so interesting yeah. and so unusual yeah. and so in inspiring. Like you, there's so many words to describe his life. Uh, for each of you, when you when you're getting ready to do this, you're obviously researching a little bit more, diving deeper into the people around him. Can you share a little bit about what you learned that really surprised you? <coughs> well, I was I was um, really lucky to have uh, Robert. Um, Gilson in real life wrote letters sort of throughout his college days um, almost daily to, to his family and also to um, to a, a girl that he was sort of falling madly in love with called Estelle um, so you get you get this like day by day account um, throughout the war of of what he was experiencing and also because they were so passionate about writing and and theater and the arts that um, the language that he uses is so expressive and, and you, you get such an insight into um, w although they're they're experiencing these, you know, horrific things on a on a daily basis, he still notices that the beauty of of gunfire at night, um, mm. and to be able to appreciate that kind of beauty, if it if it wasn't such a such a terrible thing, um, so that was yeah. that was kind and of. I had a I had a book of poetry that was published posthumously by Tolkien that Jeffrey had written, and it would just that sort of became the Bible for me, you know, <coughs> looking at that book of poetry and each poem and going, uh, in what situation would he have had to be in to have written this? Who, d who is this about? Is this about Tolkien? Is this about robbers? You know, so that was, r that was a really sort of interesting uh, thing to have as well as you having the letters, you know? Uh, for me, it was, it was really <coughs> enlightening to see how Tolkien's uh, love for fellowship and acceptance and support in his life was was then so prevalent in his in his later works you know um how the how the how the fellowship had such a profound effect on him that he he wrote and created worlds around it mm -hmm. um yeah and and to see where that came from was was a really nice thing and for me it's you know being a fan and having read the books before you know a lot long time before I actually researched or dug into his real life. For me, the surprising element was that you kind of see Tolkien, as I thought, you know, with C.S. Lewis in a pub in Eagle Child in Oxford, chatting about elves, you know, drinking a beer. Which we did. Which we of went course, there. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Too much. Um, but uh, what surprised me is this young man who's experienced, as said, darkness in a way and found his way to light. And you can also see this allegory in his life and in this film, hopefully, that that you can then read the books, reread the books, and get another layer on them. And for me, the books actually are now a more touching experience because I can read, I can see Tolkien's real life experiences there. Not necessarily one to one, but the emotions that he had that he then brought into the books. That's what I think is going to be so interesting when people see this movie. I think everyone is going to rewatch The Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. and see a completely different movie than what originally they saw you know I, I and that's one of the reasons i can't wait to see this film is just to appreciate his life even more but uh i want to talk a little bit about the editing room because ultimately that's the final rewrite mm. uh talk a little bit about how maybe the movie changed in the editing room what you learned about the footage you had in the editing room well 
I mean, I work with Hari Ulana, who's edited all my films, and we have this very, we have a system or a method that we experiment. We kind of stretch the material as wide as possible. Like, here's the script, which goes to, from A to B and then to C to D. And then you kind of actually start experimenting in the, you know, let's, what if the film starts from this, you know, the ending moment? What if it, you know, that, which is the fun, funniest part. And what possibly the rewrite in the edit was that it became a bit more kind of internal and going more and more into his imagination. And the, the, the strength of the story of the fellowship and love was there. And then the third kind of element, how do we portray creation? That was something in the edit we brought more and more. I wanted to bring more kind of the fantastical images and the, the elements kind of seeing the Mordor or seeing the Middle Earth that I saw and those characters. And I think that was something that kind of was an added layer during the post-production phase. That's one of the things in the trailer, you can see a shot of like, I want to say it's gunfire or something, and then you can see uh, the Balrog or, you know, that you can see some of that stuff. So that's stuff that you did in the editing room. The idea was that this is a young man sketching. He's kind of a painter in a way that, you know, he's doing lines and he's drawing lines one by one. He's creating and slowly and slowly that, you know, his masterpiece is evolving. So nothing there is, the idea is nothing there is finished yet. It's kind of a sketch how he first sees it, or the second time he sees it. And then later on, he uses that, what he sees or experiences in his mythologies. Uh, for the three of you, I would imagine making this movie is an experience you're never going to forget. But when you think back on the film, uh, being on set and making this thing, what's like the day that you will always remember that really stands out, whether it be because someone screwed up or it was just an awesome day on the, set? There was, a, there was a pool room scene. <laughs> in, in the film and it was just like I've never billiards, we were, we were billiards. billiards and we were just crying with laughter mm. I don't think I've ever just laughed so much while trying to do a scene yeah and uh, it actually I actually when we finished it I went this scene is gonna be awful I was like there's no way this can look good and whether it was Dome's directing or Paddy's acting it looks amazing it's like one of my favorite bits in the film where uh, Paddy's character stands up to Owen Teal mm. and it's it's amazing I think like the, the energy of all of us you know almost breaking and being very professional. Funny, but it I looks good. Yeah, and you know? what I remember as well, going like a really rapid switch in energy from like, for, for me anyway, yeah. when, when I go to confront, and I think Owen Teal is such a commanding presence and an incredible actor that it was impossible to stay in that schoolboy mode. I was like instantly pulled, you out of it. pulled me out yeah. of it. And, and that was, uh, that that was that was fun. But you're great. Enough. I love that bit. It's really like it's it's a, you know a kid coming into himself. You know, it's like standing up for the first time to his dad, and it's it's just it's a, it's a really cool bit. I really like that. For my money, I <laughs> I um, <coughs> I really enjoyed the uh, rugby scene. Oh yeah, yeah. rugby. That, that was our first. That was our first scene that we shot, and it was um, it was a, an Oxford versus Cambridge University. Mm. Rugby match in the uh, in the in the sludge in the mud, mm -hmm. and we were playing alongside that. So the other players who weren't <laughs> 15. who weren't actors were about fifteen, sixteen year old Liverpoolian college students yeah. who um, who play rugby nearly every day. Yeah. So they know what they're doing. There was no choreography. It was not like it wasn't like okay, <laughs> you're gonna go. Like a ball, get him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then also the, the, the kids quickly realised that if they tackled Nick, they would be in the film. <laughs> yeah. They started fighting over each other. Going, we all want to fucking tackle Nick. We all want to tackle Nick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It, was like, it was like a big old thing. Yeah. Uh, that's. Okay. <laughs> He's projecting. He projects. He projects. He's, an act, he's a theatre actor. Just to be clear, like Tolkien loved rugby, and the, you know a lot of many of the fellowship also loved rugby, and that that was actually how originally they kind of met on the rugby field of King Edward. So it's actually dramatically important to his life. The specific match. What is it um, as a director? And, uh, and a as actors, are you sort of looking at the first day being like, please let it be something easy, or because that, that's you know a rugby scene's like a big kind of thing. To do on your first day. Yeah, and there were some pretty hefty tackles being thrown yeah. in as well. It was, it was I great. I loved it. Absolutely yeah, it annihilated by Anto. Yeah, um, great, there's pretty there's quickly. A slow motion scene. There's a great slow motion scene where, where, where Per Patrick is running <laughs> down the wing and the Goliath that is myself just crushes him just straight into the ground. You the Muck, it's, you'll see it. It's, it's unbelievable. All. It's really like, it's just... It's it's amazing. It's, it's I just feel bad for him, but it's Brian really good. Brian O'Driscoll actually wrote me an email. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Stringer, <laughs> bit of Irish rugby. Church, I usually you know. uh, I usually <laughs> direct. I usually kind of we kind of nitpick very. Uh, we kind of choose very accurately what's the first team of actors, and in this case, 
I, I thought that it, because it's physical, it's something very physical. So you don't go into a mental. When they arrived, we had already been shooting a couple of weeks when the older TCPS arrived. So it's like, okay, if we do a scene where they just chat around or they talk around, what happens is like we might not start with the right energy, mm. their voyage. So it's actually kind of chosen that we want to do rugby first. The physicality of it, the kind of jumping into the film felt right for these these guys. Yeah, I was just worried in case one of us got injured and then the, the, the <laughs> shoot was done. And one of us broke a leg in the first day. I, that's what I was sort of getting at though. Like <laughs> yeah. when you have a, something like this, like like you almost want to save it for the last day of filming in case like something goes wrong. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But I think it don't make completely yeah. right there because it, it just made us just, you know, go, right, here we are. Let's go. Head and I think first, none of know. these things we knew at the time as well. It wasn't like we were aware, yeah. you know, that you were doing this the, this stuff kind of on purpose so mm. and it, it definitely all added to it i mean jumping evil into it in that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> evil master plan. there's always an evil master plan totally um i'm basically out of time but i want to ask uh one or two fun questions uh for you what tv show would you love to guest direct and for the three of you uh what tv show would you love to guest star on uh for me the answer is easy i would love to direct silmarillion Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to pay for that, it? That's a bigger project than I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I, I think there's, a, there's I, for instance, the Game of Thrones uh, creators must have read uh, the Silmarillion a couple of times. There's definitely that. The arcs and the stories of, and the, the humanity and how we see perceive humans and the evil and the good sides of us and the philosophical elements of humanity are in that, in that book. I would love to do that. I just... Uh, and then if I would be able to do, as a young fan of Twin Peaks, that would be my second mm -hmm. choice, gonna yes. make a new season of Twin Peaks, I would love to do that. I think I'd have to say Fargo, I think, just because it's such a wild mm. style, and I'm a massive fan of the film, so yeah. There's a French drama on Netflix called Call My Agent, which is so beautifully crafted and written, and it's, it's one of the things I, I watch, if I'm watching it on my own, I find myself cheering a lot when, when something happens for a character so invested so i'd like to do that although i'd need to learn french <laughs> <laughs> can you not speak french okay you, oh, there we go uh for me there was a there was a there was a children's program on when i was a child uh, when i was a child believe it or not um <laughs> called balamori oh, which amazing. which i was obsessed with as a kid and uh if i could go on and do like a, a little guest stint on that and maybe sit down and read a bedtime story or like something like that that'd be that'd be pretty cool is that pc plum pc plum no. What do you call the woman in the wheelchair? She's the teacher. Yes, yes, yes. What's yeah. her name? Yeah, oh, I can't remember. Mrs. Um, anyway. No, yes, I, rem I remember, I remember that. It. Yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. You'd be good in that. My last thing, because we're at WonderCon, um, a lot of people here collect something, whether it be movie posters, comic books, shoes, whatever it may be. Um, is there anything for each of you that you collect? Um, I collect shirts and books. So I might kind of wander around and just see if I find a book about Tolkien or about analysis of his stories that I don't have. And then I'm, uh, I love geek shirts. Uh, I, have a, I have a shirt which is basically the you know, best brew of Brie, which is the prancing pony. Sure. And you know, those kind of like shirts that are, you know, that those who know, they see the shirt, you don't, it's not obvious. So I love those kind of shirts that have an inner message or a hidden Easter egg I, in it. I totally know what you're saying and I agree. When it doesn't say the actual title, but it's something from the movie or something from the show, I, I completely agree. Oh, I don't know. I mean, someone, cause somebody asked me what's my like geek thing and I, I did magic when I was, oh. since I was like nine. It's out now, it's out. So, so he's so amazing. So if they have any, he's if amazing. they have any like, Magic stalls, not Magic the Gathering. What? They're like even, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we were yeah. at a bar in New York, and Paddy pulled out um, a deck of cards, and there must have been fifty people in this bar. <laughs> Paddy was bamboo. It was like David Blaine. <laughs> he was bamboozling everyone, and everyone was like, you know, cheers, and he didn't pay for a drink all night. It was like, <laughs> and, then a, so and then good. a pigeon, and then yeah, like yeah. squirrels just really flying out the back. It was, it was so good, honestly. <laughs> I'm so, really yeah. proud of but you. Hopefully, if they have any Magic stalls, I'm there. What about you, Anthony Boyle? I, I don't actually, I don't collect anything, I don't think. No. Act, like, acting you know, awards just, for Anthony. Just the awards. <laughs> 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 awards. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I don't actually, I don't collect, I don't collect anything, I don't think, no. No, it's cool. I'm sorry to let you down. I've recently started a uh, record collection. Oh. So like uh, vinyls and stuff. Sure. So uh, I'm on, currently I'm on about, t t t t it's early days. It's only been about three or four months, so I'm on about 15. Right, that, that, I'm gonna give you fair warning now. 
it's going to get uh, it's going to end up taking over your flat yeah. or wherever you're living. Uh, it, it, it's an addiction. Yeah. I know a lot of people where you walk in and it's you know something out of a. Well, I'm looking out of renting an extra space. So just to put records. Just, just remember, Guillermo del Toro has, has, has the bleak house. <laughs> he has a spare house <laughs> for his stuff. <laughs> so, you know, um, hey, listen, in, in all seriousness, I really cannot wait to see the movie. And I'm so appreciative you guys came in at WonderCon. I so suggest walking around the con a little bit wait. and like just yeah. walking up and down the aisles and, and scoping out what's there. You really, it's really like nothing else. Amazing. I promise. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.